uh, again, Weston Miller with OSU. I go by he, him pronouns, and it's a pleasure to have you joining the webinar this morning. Here's a preview of what we're gonna talk about. Uh, the historical climate of the Pacific Northwest, the evidence about climate change being super clear, and then just what we can expect as a result of that with regards to weather and uh, wanna really highlight what's a gardener and landscaper to do, and also talk about a couple of the programs that OSU is doing that are trying to be proactive about climate change. And as I'm going, don't uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat. About halfway through, I'll stop and uh, take a break and we'll entertain those questions. And then again, at the end as well. Just a quick distinction for you, that is a uh, weather and climate. Weather is short term, in the sort of the minutes to months time frame, it includes temperature, humidity, precipitation, wind, and air pressure. And climate is the average of weather over time. And the time frame is longer, decades and centuries. Here we are in the Pacific Northwest, uh, at least on the, the Western Oregon here, we have a maritime climate that's similar in a lot of ways to uh, the other areas in black in the world map here. So this is a Mediterranean climate characterized by mild wet winters and wet would be the operative word for the last month here. And then warm dry summers. And that would be the operative word for last summer so that's, those are the general characteristics of a Mediterranean climate. Other locations around the globe include the Mediterranean itself, areas of um, South America, South Africa, and um, Australia, all of them basically between the 30th and 45th parallels. Uh, you should know that in a Mediterranean climate, drought happens. It happens seasonally, uh, so our dry summers, it happens periodically happens regionally. So uh, maybe this last year, a little drier in the south of Oregon than up in the Willamette Valley. But you should note that definitely all of the Western United States is in a, a current extended drought. Um, hopefully the rain we're getting is gonna address that to a degree. Uh, but this really sad um, rhododendron says a lot about the climate, or excuse me, the weather of last summer. Uh, if, for you plant geeks out there, I, I definitely encourage you to think about plant hardiness zones um, in the Willamette Valley here, zone 8A and 8B. Um, we can expect lows down to about 10 to 20 degrees. This year, my understanding is it's been maybe around 20, 22 degrees or so. So that's uh, in line with our expected um, hardiness zones. So hardiness is how cold, uh, a plant can withstand without uh, experiencing damage. Uh, also, if you're a plant person and you don't already have the Sunset Western Gardener Garden Book, it's a great resource. It has a little more specific information about climates, growing season, um, annual inches of precipitation, and so on. Um, definitely highly recommended for that, but also just lots of really great information regarding plant resources. Also want to make a distinction about microclimate. It's really specific to where your site is. On the left-hand side, uh, you can see the on the left-hand part of the mountain, it's shaded. Uh, on the right-hand side of the mountain, it's more sunny. So if you're on a hill, depending on where you're facing with regards to north and south, that's going to dictate your microclimate quite a bit. Also, the buildings and the trees on your site are also going to um, really influence how warm or how cool different spots on your property get. On the right-hand side, in an ideal world, we would maybe provide some shade trees to the south and west of our buildings to help to, to cool those spaces a little bit. Um, but then also you should know that uh, anything you plant on the south side of a house is going to get much, much, much warmer than on the north side of a house. So those are all important considerations with regards to placing plants and thinking about them in your site. Also wanna point out that um, WSU has an awesome publication on how to determine your garden microclimate. If you've never taken the time to think about your microclimate, I highly recommend you, you check this out. And then just a couple really specific uh, aspects of our, um, our, our region, and that is 
you know, mostly we are influenced by the Pacific Ocean, but the Columbia Gorge is a conduit that connects us to the interior of the continent. And every so often there's some really cold air that flows down the Columbia re uh, River and then impacts uh, sites, especially in North Portland, but it can flow all the way down the Willamette Valley, um, sometimes during the winter. Also, this influences the winds quite a bit uh, that happen in our region. And then uh, this is a map of Northeast Portland, um, pointing out that areas where there is lots of concrete and asphalt are going to be termed urban heat islands. And you know, down in the Salem area, around the airport, around the capital, around all the shopping malls, et cetera, those would be urban heat islands that are going to absorb and radiate more heat uh, over time. So in, in city areas, it's typically a couple degrees warmer than surrounding countryside during the heat of the summer because of all that uh, thermal mass of our buildings and roads and all of that infrastructure. Um, the, the evidence about climate change is clear. And if you have any questions about it, I would direct you to the National Climate Assessment and specifically chapter 24 has information about the Northwest. A uh, couple details about that. Uh, here's what climate, like disagreement about climate looks like. So these are data sets from NASA, from NOAA, from the Japanese Meteorological Agency. And they're all showing that similar upward curve of temperatures rising across the globe. What we can expect as a result of all that is that the frequency and the intensity of extreme weather will increase. So there's lots of uncertainty about climate change, but I can guarantee you that the frequency and the intensity of extreme weather will increase. That's what you can expect moving forward. Here's a couple of examples for you. So these sort of uh, aberrant freezing and snow patterns, both early and late, they're gonna be difficult for your your landscape trees, et cetera, especially for evergreen shrubs. It also changes flowering and fruiting in terms of uh, growing fruit trees, et cetera. Those pesky freezing rain incidents that, that have been happening over the last couple of years, that's the kind of event that you can expect more of. Uh, really strong storm winds as well. This is my house in Southeast Portland and the way that storms work in the Northern hemisphere is that the, the, um, the winds whip around counterclockwise. So that means that the super strong storm winds happen from the Southeast. And those, that big set of dug fur there are to the Southeast of my house. So that has given me pause of, oh my goodness, you know, these big trees with lots of wind resistance um, in the direction of the storm winds that could then fall on my house. So we've taken some, some efforts to try to address that situation. A couple of years ago, we had them thinned up. Um, and yet, <laughs> uh, last summer during January, uh, this is what occurred in those trees. A big top of one fell down. Fortunately, it came within inches of hitting my travel trailer, uh, but didn't cause any damage, but it did damage my fence a little bit. So for me, um, as a way to be proactive about climate change and dealing with my trees. I've, I have a good relationship with an arborist and he was on call ready to come out to my place that next morning and help me to deal with this mess. Um, fire preparedness is not the topic of this presentation, but if you've never thought about it, I highly recommend that you dive into that deeply, especially if you live in the urban rural interface. OSU has some good publications on fire resistant plants for home landscapes and strategies. Um, please check that out and do what you can to prepare your property for the potential of fire damage. And then just a couple more instances of our sort of changing climate scenario. This is Detroit Lake from a couple years ago. Um, awfully low, I think last summer when I saw it, it was about the same. Uh, though again, Detroit Lake, those pesky algae blooms, so warmer water temperatures lead to uh, algae blooms, and that makes it unsafe for people and pets to be using the recreation areas, and then let alone drinking water. And then that wildfire smoke we've had over the last number of years is also just 
more uh, evidence of a change in climate that we're gonna need to deal with. And then you might remember back to June, late June of last year, that heat dome that occurred. And um, you know, as a horticulture guy, it's been really interesting to, for me to see all the damage that occurred, the time frame by which it occurred, and then how those things are handling uh, things about now. But uh, generally, you can expect that when um, plants are damaged, like on the left-hand side, the Virginia there is going to be able to be fine this next year. But on the right-hand side, the little landscape conifer might suffer for a couple years or so. But ultimately, will probably grow back, grow back fine, provided enough water is provided along the way. Here's just a couple more uh, incidences or, you know, uh, I guess examples of plant damage from the heat dome I saw last year. A lot of it was like west facing uh, parts of plants and a lot of it was parts of plants in close proximity to lots of concrete or asphalt where the temperatures were even higher. And then I think what really uh, sort of makes me the most sad and alarms me the most is that Doug Douglas firs in the Willamette Valley are suffering uh, a lot. And uh, once they start to dry out, they have a hard time recovering. When forest trees or Doug fir in urban areas do start to experience drought stress, then they're gonna be more um, susceptible to beetles and things like that. So it really is a bit of a double whammy that's occurring for Douglas firs from drought stress. And then uh, at least in the Portland area here, uh, Western red cedars, which are large and established, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, they're not looking so good these days. Um, it's just been too dry for them the last number of summers in order to thrive. So in this case, on the left-hand side, that tree in the local cemetery has been cut down. On the right-hand side, that Western red cedar is not going to survive and is going to need to be removed sooner than later. A couple other things you can expect is that uh, insects life cycles are temperature dependent. And if it's a little bit warmer, if it gets, if uh, you know, uh, degree days start to accumulate early or in the spring and go longer into the fall, that means that there's gonna be time for additional insect generations to occur. So we can expect basically that uh, climate change is expected to increase insect activity and crop loss. And that could be extended to landscapes as well. Uh, pest problems happen. Here's the brown marmorated stink bug, a relatively new introduced pest. You can see where it's established in Oregon. So that would be the kind of uh, pest that uh, warmer temperatures will favor. Uh, I'll just pass on that because we're a little pressed for time today. Um, we'll also say that you can also expect that with warmer temperatures, that's going to favor weedy vegetation. So it, when it warms up in the spring, things will start growing. They'll have capacity to spread their seeds more. It's gonna change the, uh, the range in terms of latitude and the range in terms of elevation and the phenology of lots and lots of different weedy species that we experience. So that's gonna have you know, specific economic costs in terms of folks trying to control invasive plants and their properties. So uh, weeds might become a bit more aggressive and you can see here a bunch of annual weeds with a bed of kale and all, especially summer annual weeds like pigweed and crabgrass, uh, those will really um, do better than they already do. And those are plants that are specifically designed to thrive in disturbed soil and warm soil conditions, making it harder for you to do your gardening. So now's a time to take a bit of a break. If any folks have questions out there, uh, you could lob them into the, the chat and um, Becky can read them out. We have nothing in the chat so far. Okay. All right. Well, if not, no one has a question oh, at this time, I will keep going. We just going. got one. We got one. Okay. Um, oh, well, Jennifer says, I definitely noticed the prolific proliferation of crabgrass this past year. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a lot of those summer annual weeds, I've also noticed that quite a bit. And I pay a fair amount of attention to... Um, 
some Facebook sites and next door app and things like that and sort of track the kinds of problems that people are having. Uh, voles would be really high on that list. Um, and then lots of weedy vegetation as well that proliferates in those warmer type conditions. We have had a couple of more questions come in. Yeah. Kate asks, how do you stay optimistic about the future? That's a great question. How do I stay optimistic about the future? Um, I think that's where gardening comes into play because we can take some control for our lives by growing our own food, by choosing plants that are gonna be drought tolerant and creating habitat, and by trying to be proactive about uh, choosing more drought tolerant plants and choosing plants that might be able to do better in the, the warmer type conditions. So I guess I'm from California, so I look to the, the set of plants that I grew up with as you know, maybe things that we should be planting in our area moving forward. Um, and then otherwise, uh, there are so many big picture questions about climate change. I think it's a matter of uh, taking control of the things that we have sway over. We also have in the chat from Jane, she asked, um, what are good resources for finding appropriate native plants? And Jenny from Marion SWCD uh, posted a link there um, in the chat. Yeah, there's lots of good resources for native plants. Uh, with regards to native plants, I would just say that don't assume that they're totally drought tolerant. You're going to still have to water them to get them established. Uh, they might look a little bit ragged, but they'll probably survive uh, during hot, dry summers. Um, but overall, they're going to help to create habitat. And that's a really good thing because uh, as you all are probably aware, pollinators are having challenges, other forms of wildlife, et cetera. There really is quite a bit you can do. And the evidence is starting to mount that you know, urban areas are sort of key to maintaining biodiversity of pollinators and whatnot, because there's just so many plants of interest to pollinators growing in urban areas. Okay, we did have another question pop up. If insect pests do better with warmer weather, what about our pollinator species and beneficial insects? Yes, absolutely. So uh, insects as temperature dependent organisms will all be doing better. Um, so that would be all a matter of attracting them to your site. And then hopefully with the beneficial insects, they'll help you to control the aphids and the, the cabbage moths and things like that. So that's, you know, again, just uh, providing for habitat through native plants and also lots of pretty flowers. So a lot of the mint family plants, um, grow, uh, letting things like broccoli or arugula flower are really good. Buckwheat, um, insectary plants would be highly recommended in terms of your natural pest control strategies. Okay, great. Thank you for the questions. That helps me to know that people are out there and listening. Um, I will keep going here. So uh, what's a gardener landscaper to do about all this? We're gonna talk about putting carbon into the soil. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about drought tolerant plants and getting them established and some other strategies. Uh, first of all, this is a, uh, a graphic that shows the general makeup of agricultural soils. Uh, it turns out that water and air are about 50% of soil. In the mineral part, the, the rock, the sand, the silt is about 45%. And then really importantly, the organic matter is about 5%. And uh, with organic matter, I would say th this is you, one of the best ways to drought proof your site is by putting organic matter into the soil because it helps plants to grow. It's key to long-term fertility. It's gonna improve the quality of most soils. When organic matter breaks down, it forms a glue, causing the soil particles to stick together. That makes more space for air and water. That's what you know, uh, um, plants really need. It strengthens the aggregates, improves the water holding capacity of the soil. It releases plant nutrients and it provides food for beneficial organisms. So many, many reasons to add organic matter to your soil. Here's a uh, sort of a, um, when you feed organic matter, in essence, you are feeding the soil biological activity in your soil. And in just one gram of soil, 
There are 100 million to a billion bacteria, actinomycetes, uh, up to 100 million, fungi, up to a million, algae, protozoa, nematodes. So you're feeding the biological activity. When they break the organic matter down, that helps to strengthen the aggregates of your soil and improves the overall quality. Uh, with organic matter, again, it's the glue and it's gonna help to create spaces between the soil and that's where the air and the water will help to in infiltrate. And really importantly, with regards to organic matter, humus is sort of the, the sweet spot of soil organic matter. Um, it's the ultimate stage of decomposition. And it turns out that humus particles in the soil will stay there anywhere from a hundred to 5,000 years. So if we're trying to like uh, capture carbon in soil and we get it broken down by organic, by uh, the living organisms that forms humus, and then it's gonna be stable. It stays there a long time. So I guess one of the very best strategies that we all can do as land stewards is to add organic matter to the soil, let the microbes break it down, and then have this stable organic matter that stays there for a long time. So that's good in terms of sequestering carbon. And it also happens to be really great in terms of uh, feeding plants. The humus sort of um, uh, loosely holds on to minerals like calcium and magnesium and things like that, and then gives them off to the plants as they need them. So it really helps to mediate and facilitate the plant nutrient uh, exchange process. Um, if you have a new construction site, you're gonna to wanna to start by improving the soil. So this would be, you know, uh, in this photo here, you can see straight up subsoil, super compacted by machines. This isn't a great place for plants to grow. Uh, so I would start by adding compost to it. Um, in a new construction situation, you might think about doing it with a backhoe or a, a mini excavator. So trying to dig down organic matter about two, feet down into the ground is going to be the best way to kickstart that biological activity. Uh, if you're going to be digging in the soil before you dig, you need to call 811 to get a utility locate to make sure you don't hit a water pipe or a gas line. In sort of a, a less extreme example, uh, your job before you go planting is to add organic matter to the soil and dig it in as much as you can uh, using a shovel like this. Uh, just uh, spreading out compost and aggregate over an area, digging it in the best you can with a shovel is gonna be the very first thing you wanna do before planting new plants. Also wanna point out that you can add organic matter on the top of your soil with mulch. Uh, bark dust is fine, but arborist chips like this are going to be better for the soil ultimately they kind of have a mm, sort of the right carbon nitrogen um, mix to break down and really help to encourage um, soil organic matter formation. Let's talk a little bit about lawns. <clears throat> so people probably assume that lawns are gonna be your worst bet for climate change. And uh, I'll go ahead and argue that that's not necessarily the case but it does depend on a couple things. First is mowing height. If you mow a lawn really tight or short, then the root mass is gonna be proportional to that. If you leave the blades of your lawn a little bit longer, then the root mass will be proportional to the longer blades, as you can see on the right-hand side. So by really uh, mowing at two, two and a half, even three inches, is gonna be the best way to encourage root growth underneath the ground, um, and then that's, taking in carbon and storing it down in the, the soil. Uh, here you can see that a little bit more dramatically with uh, on your left hand side, two inch mowing, on your right hand side, half inch mowing. Look at the, the, the root mass is very much proportional to the height of the blades of the grass. And um, so uh, one of our uh, researchers in the horticulture department at OSU is doing research on soil carbon accumulation in turf grass. And what they've found basically is that with uh, lawns in essence, 
that they accumulate levels of carbon in the soil comparable to regenerating forests and to fallowed croplands. So that's actually really good news for urban land managers. And then there's a big comma, however, uh, our maintenance activities produce carbon dioxide and N2O from fertilizer breakdown, and those are greenhouse gases. The good news is that there's ways to minimize the emissions you're gonna do with regards to lawn care, and that's gonna be human power or battery power for mowing lawns. So on your left-hand side, the push mower, that's not adding carbon except for from respiration from the operator to the atmosphere. And then in terms of fertilizer to reduce the amount of fertilizer you need to use to keep a lawn looking good, using a mulching mower, uh, the red blade in that picture is a mulching blade that's gonna chop up grass particles very finely. They fall to the soil, they, um, they feed uh, the nitrogen to the soil and you don't have to add additional nitrogen fertilizers to keep the lawn looking good in that way. So with lawns, if you really focus on um, lawn health and minimizing carbon emissions by maintaining them, you're actually doing a pretty good job of sequestering carbon for soils. And then I'll go ahead and just make a pitch for eco lawns. Um, typically when people think about lawns, they think about grasses, but it turns out that uh, if you include mm, yarrow, clovers, uh, other broadleaf plants in lawns, they are number one, more drought tolerant, and number two, a whole lot more biodiverse for all of those pollinators and whatnot. So in this photo on the upper part, that's yarrow and ryegrass mixed together. And then on the lower part is just ryegrass after five weeks without water, the eco lawn is looking really good. Um, so enabling you to decrease water use, increase the biodiversity of the site, and uh, still durable, suitable for kids playing and dogs running, et cetera. With regards to plants, do your research. Here are two of my favorite books in terms of researching plants for uh, gardening, landscaping projects. I already mentioned the Sunset Western Garden book on your left-hand side. On the right-hand side is a book called Right Plant, Right Place. So for example, you can choose plants for dry shade in that, which is a pretty hard place to grow plants like underneath a dug fir. Uh, so it sort of provides specific climate scenarios in terms of sun and soil and suitable plants for those regions or not regions, but um, areas in your site. Choosing drought tolerant plants. Uh, I would say that would be one of the most important things you can do moving forward if you have an opportunity to um, replace plants on your site or to install new ones, um, choosing them such that they're going to do well without a lot of supplemental water. The photo here shows Ceanothus, which is California blue blossom, um, one of the very best because it, it is very drought tolerant. It actually doesn't really like a lot of water during the summer at all. It's phenomenal at attracting the pollinators. It's an excellent landscape plant for a lot of reasons. Drought tolerant plants are ones that after a short establishment period, they'll grow and flower normally without any supplemental irrigation. And in the photo here is cystus, which is from the Mediterranean region, definitely going to do really well without a lot of supplemental water once established. Here's an example. I believe this is from the Oregon Garden, and you can see a mixture of a lot of drought tolerant plants. There's the ceanothus in the middle, and then there's the cystus with the pink flowers, and then there are a bunch of mint family plants, rosemary, perovskia, phlomis. Uh, there's an artichoke in there as well. Those are going to all be really drought tolerant, uh, grow well without a lot of supplemental water. The way to do that is to back up a little bit. Remember when I talked about soil preparation, if you prepare soil really well, you choose drought tolerant plants and then you ah, water them to get them established. That's gonna be really your best way to go to set up plants to handle what we can expect will be more drought conditions coming down the line. 
I'll also just say uh, if you're choosing plants, avoid high maintenance plants that might require pesticides, let's say insecticides, fungicides. Um, in terms of roses, there are disease resistant roses that avoid black spot, rust and powdery mildew. In terms of azaleas and rhododendrons, there are resistant varieties in terms of azalea lace bug. If you have an opportunity to avoid major pest problems up front, you absolutely want to do that. Similar with apples, uh, other kinds of things that you might want to grow. Um, overall, please avoid planting invasive plants, butterfly bush, holly, knotweed, spurge laurel, tree of heaven, and more. Uh, unfortunately, those things are still sold in a lot of cases. Um, if you know what they are and avoid them, that's going to be better in the long run for you and for your neighbors and for local wild areas. Irrigation systems are awesome. However, they have a cost of installation, um, the cost of the water, will that go up? Will there be rationing in, in future years? Um, also with watering, you're contributing to summer weed issues. So again, uh, choosing drought tolerant plants, watering for plant establishment. Ideally planting in the fall is the best time to get plants well established. Um, so then you don't have to think about them at all until May or so. And then at that time, uh, probably the first summer, maybe even the second summer, having a way to water your plants is, a, is recommended, even if they're drought tolerant. I'm a big fan of temporary drip irrigation systems where um, choosing drought tolerant plants, but then watering them to get them established using drip irrigation is a, an efficient way to go. I took this picture last summer and someone spent an awful lot of money to establish some new landscape trees for a development. And then I looked closely, each tree only had one emitter, uh, just absolutely not enough water to, um, <clears throat> to keep uh, larger specimen trees like this going. So uh, doing your research, making sure you have enough water being applied via drip irrigation for larger trees. I guess uh, a couple notes about protecting plants during cold spells. Uh, we know that they're gonna happen. We know they might happen a little earlier or a little bit later. Uh, so be prepared with your heat blank or your, your plant blankets or even plastic or even just blankets that you drape over plants that are cold sensitive. I suppose last summer as well, during the heat dome, I saw a lot of people setting up little shade structures to protect their, their sensitive plants during really hot weather. So all that just takes paying attention to the weather, knowing the plant's tolerances, and then responding accordingly, proactively, or just knowing that there might be loss of plants due to the weather, and that's an opportunity to replace them with less high maintenance plants. Uh, in terms of vegetable gardening, uh, you have an opportunity to use season extension. This is row cover fabric. This is a site where I used to grow a lot of vegetables in Southeast Portland. We were growing uh, for restaurants and for a community supported agriculture. Uh, we use the row cover fabric mostly for pest control. Um, so insect screening and row cover fabric is super handy for that, those purposes to exclude pests. Um, also, definitely going to moderate the weather uh, because the, the air and the soil underneath the row covers can be warmer than the surrounding area and less susceptible to larger temperature swings that might happen day to day. I will point out that under row cover fabric, um, you have to still do insect searching uh, and, and some sort of control. So these are imported cabbage moss, Underneath the tent here on the right hand side, that's cabbage or broccoli family growing. We would do a, a search mission every week or so to find pests and pluck them off. Because if the pests get in under row cover fabric, they're gonna sort of have a heyday with their favorite food. Flea beetles would be another example of a crop that the row cover helps to protect from. A couple more tips for you with regards to climate change. 
Um, so certainly you can reduce your overall um, contribution to carbon dioxide and whatnot, thinking about getting used tools and equipment, um, thinking about minimizing your use of single use plastics in gardening and landscaping and um, other parts of life for that matter, recycling food and scraps from the garden. Um, so composting for sure. I already talked about human powered or electric equipment with regards to lawn care. The new, like the latest generation of battery powered uh, lawn equipment really has enough uh, power to do a pretty good job. There's absolutely no need to use internal combustion engines anymore for lawn care. Also uh, peat and peat based products are definitely a bummer. So peat moss is scraped away from bogs in northern latitude areas. So very energy intensive. And then you get these bricks of peat moss, but there certainly are other choices you can use. For soil, I would say compost, for potting mixes, etc. cetera. Quar based products is a byproduct of the um, coconut, excuse me, the palm oil industry would be a more sustainable choice. Just wanna talk about a couple of the uh, efforts that OSU is doing to try to confront climate change issues head on. And the first is a project that I'm manager for and that's called Solve Pest Problems. So as I mentioned earlier, if we know that weeds, insect pests, et cetera, are gonna get worse, then wouldn't it be awesome if we provided a really great user-friendly way for the public to find information and make appropriate choices about that? So animals like mice, disease problems, insects like Japanese beetle, weeds like not weeds, et cetera. So we're, we're trying to be forward thinking and give people um, key information upfront so that they can make good choices and uh, hopefully sustainable choices. The purpose of the program is to reduce the impacts of pests and pest management practices on people in the environment and non-agricultural settings. OSU already has awesome pest management resources for agriculture, very specifically my stakeholders, including SWCDs and Metro, the regional government and city of Gresham and city of Portland and other folks are really encouraging us to provide information for regular folks uh, property managers, rural, urban areas, um, people who manage like a daycare center, et cetera, for them to have access to pest management resources. So we're in process of, of making content and in 2022 plan to launch about 100 priority pest pages. We have a really wide range of partners and sponsors for solve pest problems. Uh, what I'm most proud of about this is that it includes Oregon Environmental Council, uh, sort of the, um, the environmental lobbyists in their state. And it also includes the Farm Bureau and the Oregonians for Food and Shelter, the pesticide lobbyists in our state. We have all of those groups interested in helping us to make this resource happen. And the way we keep everyone under our tent is by having just straightforward science-based information without bias. Our intended audiences include folks from across the state, um, urban areas, retail nursery workers, OSU volunteers like master gardeners that I work with, uh, very specifically communities historically underserved by OSU's resources. So that's um, black, indigenous, Latinx communities. And then we expect the information will be useful for folks in Washington and Idaho and Northern California as well. So just for example, what do you do about tree of heaven in a spot like this? Right now, there's not any good organ specific information on what to do about this situation and we will solve that problem. Another really awesome project that one of my colleagues in the horticulture department is working on is called the Dry Farming Collective. And this is really going back, you know, to like the 1910s and 20s to before like uh, irrigation practices were really advanced. 
people were growing beans and squashes and corns and other things in the Willamette Valley and other places in the Northwest without supplemental irrigation. And by preparing the soil right, by getting the timing right, by choosing the right varieties, it's possible to grow crops without supplemental irrigation. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, look up OSU Dry Farming. Um, there's a lot, there's a publications available. There's a statewide network of people who are collaborating and sharing information about dry farming. And I would say is very much on the cutting edge of what we're gonna need moving forward. Just to review a little bit about what we've talked about, the his, historical climate of the Northwest, evidence about climate change being super clear that we can expect increased frequency and amplitude of severe weather events. There's a lot that we can do, um, getting carbon into the soil with our landscape practices, even with our lawn care, um, choosing drought tolerant plants, et cetera. And then uh, I, I mentioned those couple projects for you. So with that, want to open it up for any other questions that folks might have. And then in the meantime, if you want to get a hold of me, you're welcome to do so. And here's my contact information. Great. Let me check out the chat here. We've had some great conversations, um, especially in regards to um, trying to get rid of lawns and yeah. uh, tips sure. for doing that. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a proponent of lawns having their place. Uh, so if you have kids and you want them to crawl around and play, if you have a dog and you want them to run around, a small lawn is a good thing. So decreasing size would be the first thing I would recommend. And then if you're gonna do it, care for it well. If you wanna take over your lawn, there's a couple ways to go. Um, I would first wanna know what's growing there. If you have perennial grasses like quack grass, in perennial weeds like bindweed, then I would tend to want to kill that with an herbicide and then follow up by whatever practice you want to do to cover the soil or otherwise dig it in. If you just have lawn and don't have perennial weeds involved, then um, you can smother that. Uh, so what I would personally do is add some fertilizer, uh, get it really wet, put cardboard on top of it, and then put uh, either compost or well decomposed leaves on top of that, and then leave that for a, a period of time. Let's call it four to six months. And then the earthworms will work the soil from underneath and you'll end up with some pretty good soil ready to go for your veggie gardening or for a landscape area. Um, you can also go the sort of the more intensive route, which is to either scrape away with hand tools, the sod, so digging down the couple inches and or renting a sod cutting machine to cut away the lawn, expose the soil, add organic matter and build up your, your raised beds from there. Great, here's another question. Oh, oh, Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Sorry, I was trying to unmute with the space bar and it didn't work. And um, just a follow up question on that. If you do go for the sod cutting method, are you, um, you know, cutting away a lot of that topsoil and and good stuff and, um, you know, starting over with having to amend the soil with I mean, I'm, I'm just I would rather do what can be done without buying tons of compost that somebody else processed, you know, and um, yeah. so. Yeah, uh, so I would say uh, with a sod cutter, you're removing all of the organic matter up to like two inches down. Um, that That's a valuable material. And here's where, uh, you know, either smothering it or right. using herbicides strategically to kill it, that's gonna leave that material there. And then the, you know, uh, it will certainly knock, knock back soil, soil life for a period of time. Okay. But uh, once it gets an opportunity, it will recolonize and take it over for for you. So okay. I would say, uh, you know, probably the uh, embedded energy and the overall climate impact would be more by renting the machines and scraping it all away than by dealing with it in place. 
Okay, and then just one more follow up question about the perennial um, grasses. Uh, we've probably already done the cardboard method with those perennial glasses, grasses that I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. what, what are we gonna be dealing with? Are they just gonna keep coming back up or? Sure, um, you'll, you'll see them, they'll come back okay. for sure. You'll see especially quack grass is the most mm -hmm. robust of the, the kind of the weedy grassy species. And uh, when there's more organic matter, it becomes more friable and you can do a bit of a pull and uh, like a pull and pry method and mm -hmm. just keep going after it and get the as long a root chunks as you can get out of it. And it's going to be take you some time, mm -hmm. but I would tend to get those under control before you go planting perennial landscape plants or other things there, because otherwise you're going to be fighting it long term. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. Sure. Another question from the chat here. What are your recommendations on eradicating ivy and holly? Great questions. Absolutely. Uh, well, with ivy, I think the trick would be number one, dealing with it growing vertically. So up trees and fences and things like that. When ivy grows vertical, it produces the berries, the birds spread them to other areas. So that would be the first thing. You can keep ivy uh, vegetative by mowing it basically and not letting it grow vertical. So in that case, it's only problematic in a localized area um, and it's not spreading to wild natural areas and so on. Uh, you, you really have a couple choices with ivy. Uh, they're all gonna involve a fair amount of work. You can chip away at it with material, uh, with tools and roll it into a ball and get it off and then keep attacking it over the course of a couple years and you can very much um, have an effect on ivy. The other thing, if you're not averse to using herbicides, what you could do is um, mow it with a weed whacker, let the regrowth come back, it's less waxy, then spray it with herbicide and then probably let it regrow a little bit and spray it with herbicide again and it'll probably be handled in a localized area. Um, all of, and then, you know, I think another thing would be watching it over time and being ready to, to act. It's not an event. It's going to be at least a couple years of effort. And then, okay, and then holly. What I'd recommend with holly is um, cutting it down at, at the stump, basically. Uh, you don't want to let holly form berries because, again, the birds will spread it to natural areas or to your neighbor's property. And then using a brush killer type herbicide and painting it on the cut stem as directed on the, the label instructions is going to be your least effort way to deal with holly. Digging it out a large holly tree is not going to be feasible unless you have a backhoe. I believe that covered all of the questions in the chat, but if I missed any, um, feel free to add them in there now. Uh, we do have a question. And uh, maybe Jenny Meisel, if you could maybe add into that as well in the chat. Um, it says, are there recommended, are the recommended species on the Soil and Water Conservation District and other native plant lists going to be changing to reflect a warmer climate? For example, I see Western Red Cedar as a recommended tree for planting in our region, but should we be thinking about not planting that species? As sad as that would be. I could chime in if you wanted me to address the SWCD plant sale list. Um, I think Western red cedar is probably gonna end up needing to be planted more in riparian areas. I think we could still plant it and use it. We just need to be more strategic about where we're planting it. So it's not necessarily gonna be kind of an upland forest tree. And it's really not right now. It likes to grow where it's wetter anyway. So we just need to be more careful about where we're planting some of those species and realize that some of them are gonna need a little bit more water 
into the future. So I'm not willing to get rid of Western red cedar yet because it's a fantastic habitat tree. So just plant it where it's a little bit more, more wetter. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Thank you, Jenny. And we haven't had anything else pop, pop up in the chat yet. Okay. Well, uh, awesome, folks. Thanks so much for joining this morning. It's been a lot of fun. Hopefully, you got something out of this presentation. Again, uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And I suppose uh, stay dry and happy gardening in 2022. Great. Thank you, Weston. And thank you all for joining us today. Sure.